self-surrender. I fear that self-realization is no easy thing to attain. Why impede yourself by anticipating failure? Push on. Self-realization will come to an earnest seeker in a trice. To illustrate this, Sri Bhagavan told the following story. King Janaka was listening to a philosophical treatise read by the state pundit, wherein a passage occurred to the effect that a rider who had placed one foot in the stirrup, contemplating upon realization, could realize the self, before he lifted the other foot to place it in the other stirrup. That is, the passage taught that when realization comes, it comes in an instant. The king stopped the pundit from proceeding further and ordered him to prove the statement. The pundit admitted that he was only a bookworm and was unable to impart practical wisdom. Janaka suggested that the text was either false or exaggerated, but the pundit would not agree to this. Though he himself was unable to impart practical wisdom, he maintained that the text could not be false or exaggerated, since it contained the words of wise sages of the past. Janaka was annoyed with the pundit and in a fit of rage condemned him to prison. He then inflicted the same punishment on every pundit who passed for a wise man, but was unable to prove the scriptural text. For fear of being in prison, some of the pundits fled the country in voluntary exile. While two or three of them were running through a thick forest, a sage called Ashtavakra, who though young in his age, was wise in learning, happened to cross their path. Having learnt their plight, Ashtavakra offered to prove the text true to the king, and thereby have the imprisoned pundits released. Impressed by his bold assurance, they took him in a palanquin to the king. At the sight of the sage, the king stood up and saluted him with great reverence. Ashtavakra then ordered the king to release all the pundits. Janaka thought that such an order could come only from one who had the capacity to set his doubts at rest, and hence he released all the pundits and asked the sage whether he could summon the horse. The sage advised him not to be in a hurry and suggested that they should go to a solitary spot. Thereupon, the king on his horse and the sage in his palanquin went out of the city towards the forest. When they reached the forest, the sage asked the king to send back the retinue. The king did as he was asked, and then placing one of his feet in the stirrup, he requested the sage to prove the scriptural text. But the sage replied by asking whether the position in which they stood indicated a proper master-disciple relationship. The king then understood that he should show due reverence towards Ashtavakra and prayed to him for grace. The sage then addressed him as Janaka, since he was no longer a king, and told him that before being taught Brahmanyana, a true disciple, should surrender himself and all his possessions to his master. So be it, replied the sage, and disappeared into the forest. From that moment Janaka stood transfixed with one foot in the stirrup and the other dangling in the air, as if he were a statue. Saying this, Sri Bhagavan imitated the posture of King Janaka. Time passed by, and the citizens, finding no sign of their king returning, grew anxious and began to search for him. They came to the place where Janaka was standing, transfixed, and were dismayed to find him, unaware of their presence and indifferent to their earnest inquiries. They therefore began searching for Ashtabakra, who they thought must be a charlatan, and had cast a spell upon their king and vowed vengeance upon him. At the same time, being concerned with the king's condition and wanting to minister to him, They brought him back to the city on a palanquin. The king, however, continued to remain in the same condition. At last, having found Ashtabakra, the ministers entreated him to remove the alleged spell and bring the king back to his normal condition. At the same time, they charged him with the responsibility for having cast the spell. Ashtabakra treated their ignorant remarks with contempt 
and called the name of Janaka, who immediately saluted him and responded to his call. The ministers were surprised. Ashtavakrit told the king that he was being maliciously accused by the people of having brought him to some sad plight and asked him to tell the truth. On hearing this, the king angrily asked, Who said so? The ministers were taken by surprise and pleaded for mercy. Thereupon, the sage advised the king to resume his normal functions, adding that Brahmanyana could be taught only to competent persons and that since the king had successfully passed the test, he would now impart it to him. Then the sage remained alone with the king during the night and taught him the ultimate truth, saying Brahman is not anything new or apart from oneself, and no particular time or place is needed to realize it. He finally concluded by saying that thou art Tattvam Asi, that is the self, eternal, and infinite. The next morning the ministers found that the king called the assembly and performed his functions as usual. In the assembled court, Ashtavakra asked the king whether his former doubt about whether Brahmanyana could be attained as suddenly and as quickly as mentioned in the scriptures was cleared, and if so to bring the horse and demonstrate the truth of it. The king was all humility now and said, Lord, because of my immaturity, I doubted the correctness of the spiritual text. I now realize every letter of it is true. The ministers thanked the sage. The Nyani and the Siddha One day, while speaking about Hatha Yoga and related subjects, Sri Bhagavan narrated the following story from Prabhu Linga Lila. Prabhu Linga, the founder of the Lingayat sect, now mostly prevalent in Karnataka state only, was touring the land for the uplift of the spiritually minded. He met the famous yogi Kraknath in Gokarnam, a famous place of Hindu pilgrimage on the west coast of India. The yogi welcomed him respectfully, but was however proudly conscious of his own extraordinary powers over the elements. He considered his guest more or less his equal expressed pleasure at meeting him and, upon greeting him, asked who he was. Prabhu Linga replied that only the one who had destroyed his eagle, root, and branch could have thereby realized himself, and who had thereby realized himself could know who he was, and wondered what he could say to a non-entity, a person, who clung to his perishable body. Goraknath, who identified his body as himself, replied, that person alone who has gained the immortality of the body by the favor of Shiva and consumption of gulikas, medicinal herbs will never die. Therefore, one who had not gained such immortality dies. Prabhulinga remarked that knowledge consists in realizing oneself and not in immortalizing the body and went on to explain at length that the body cannot be the real self. However, Goraknath, could not be persuaded, and would not budge an inch from his ground. He proudly challenged Prabhulinga to try cutting his body, handing him a long, bright, and sharp sword. When the sword struck the body of Goraknath, it caused him no injury, but was itself blunted. Prabhulinga feigned surprise and asked Goraknath to try cutting his body. At first Goraknath hesitated to do so, saying that Prabhulinga would die. But when Prabhulinga insisted, he took up the sword and tried to cut his body. To the great surprise of Goraknath, the sword passed easily through the body of Prabhulinga without affecting it in any way. It was as if the sword was passing through empty space. Only then was Goraknath the Siddha ready to acknowledge the superiority of Prabhulinga, the Nyani. Thus his pride was humbled and he prayed to Prabhulinga to teach him the truth. Prabhulinga then expounded Brahma Vidya to Goraknath as follows. Goraknath, do not think your body to be yourself. Seek the indweller, the cave dweller, and you will once for all rid yourself of the disease of birth and death. The cave is your heart only. 
The indweller thereof is called God, and I am that. 24 Gurus A king was passing through a forest in all pomp and pageantry, with his army and retinue behind him. He came across a man with not even a kantisan, lying on the ground with one leg cocked over the other. He was laughing away, apparently supremely happy, contented with himself and all the world. The king was struck with the man's happy state and sent for him. But when the king's men approached the nude ascetic and delivered the king's message, he took absolutely no notice and continued in his ascetic bliss. On being told of this, the king himself went to the man, and even then the man took no notice. Thereupon it struck the king that this must be no common man, and said, Swami, you are evidently supremely happy. May we know what is the secret of such happiness, and from which guru you learnt it? Thereupon the ascetic told the king, I have had twenty-four gurus. Everything, this body, the earth, the birds, some instruments, some persons, all have taught me. All the things in the world may be classed as either good or bad. The good taught him what he must seek. Similarly, the bad taught him what he must avoid. The ascetic was Dattatreya, the Avadhuta. Enter the Heart A devotee who had suddenly lost his only son came to Bhagavan in a state of acute grief, seeking relief. He asked a few questions in which his grief was evident. Bhagavan, as usual, asked him to inquire into the self and find out who is grieving. The devotee was not satisfied. Bhagavan then said, All right, I will tell you a story from Vichara Sagaram. Two youngsters by name Rama and Krishna told their respective parents that they would go to foreign countries to prosecute further studies and then earn a lot of money. After some time, one of them suddenly died. The other studied well, earned a lot, and was living happily. Some time later, the one that was alive requested a merchant who was going to his native place to tell his father that he was wealthy and happy and that the other boy who had come with him had passed away. Instead of passing on the information correctly, the merchant told the father of the person who was alive that his son was dead, and the father of the person that was dead that his son had earned a lot of money and was living happily. The parents of the person that was actually dead were happy in the thought that their son would come back after some time, while the parents of the person whose son was alive but was reported to be dead were in great grief. In fact, neither of them saw their son, but they were experiencing happiness or grief, according to the reports they received. That is all. We, too, are similarly situated. We believe all sorts of things that the mind tells us and get deluded into thinking that what exists does not exist, and what does not exist exists. If we do not believe the mind but enter the heart, and see the sun that is inside. There is no need to see the children outside. Buddha During a conversation on non-attachment, Bhagavan said, In this part of the country, one of our ancients wrote, O Lord, thou hast given me a hand to use as pillow under my head, a cloth to cover my loins, hands wherewith to eat food. What more do I want? This is my great good fortune. That is the purport of the verse. Is it really possible to say how great a good fortune that is? Even the greatest kings wish for such happiness. There is nothing to equal it. Having experienced both these conditions, I know the difference between this and that. These beds, sofa, and articles around me, all this is bondage. Is not the Buddha an example of this? Ask a devotee. Thereupon Sri Bhagavan began speaking about Buddha. Yes, said Bhagavan. When the Buddha was in the palace with all possible luxuries in the world, he was still sad. To remove his sadness, his father created more luxuries than ever. But none of them satisfied the Buddha. 
At midnight, he left his wife and child and disappeared. He remained in great austerity for six years, realized the self, and for the welfare of the world became a mendicant, Bhikshu. It was only after he became a mendicant that he enjoyed great bliss. Really, what more did he require? In the garb of a mendicant, he came to his own city, did he not? asked the devotee. Yes, yes, said Bhagavan. Having heard that he was coming, his father, Sutohana, decorated the royal elephant and went out with his whole army to receive him on the main road. But without touching the main road, the Buddha came by side roads and by lanes. He sent his close associates to the various streets for alms while he himself, in the guise of a mendicant, went by another way to his father. How could the father know that his son was coming in that guise? Yasodhara, the Buddha's wife, however recognized him, made her son prostrate before his father, and herself prostrated. After that the father recognized the Buddha. Sudodhana, however, had never expected to see his son in such a state and was very angry and shouted, Shame on you! What is this garb? Does one who should have the greatest of riches come like this? I have had enough. And with that, he looked furiously at the Buddha. Regretting that his father had not yet got rid of his ignorance, the Buddha too began to look at his father with even greater intensity. In this war of looks, the father was defeated. He fell at the feet of his son and himself became a mendicant. Only a man with non-attachment can know the power of non-attachment, said Bhagavan, his voice quivering with emotion. The Sadhu and the Three Stones In 1949, the inauguration of Mother's Temple took place, and the dedicated labor of ten years was consecrated in Sri Bhagavan's presence. In front of the Matubusteswara Shrine, the Jubilee Hall was built to accommodate the ever-increasing number of devotees. A large granite couch was installed with elaborate carvings spread with a silken mattress for Bhagavan's comfort. As a big pillow was placed on one side for Bhagavan to keep his arms, another behind him to lean against and a third one at his feet, the actual seating place was considerably reduced. One day when Suri Nagama entered the hall, Sri Bhagavan said, looking at his attendants, See how this mattress slips from one side to another? People think that it will be comfortable for Bhagavan if there is a costly mattress. It is, however, not possible to sit on this restfully. Why this? It would be much more comfortable if I sat on the stone seat itself. As told in the story about the sadhu, People think that Swami is undergoing great hardship when he lives in a thatched shed and lives on a stone bench, and so they make a fuss. It will perhaps be better if, like that sadhu in the story, I gather some stones similar to those I had in the Virupaksha cave, take them to whichever place I go, and spread them on a mattress like this. A devotee asked, What is that story of the sadhu which Bhagavan has now mentioned? whereupon Bhagavan began relating the following story. The great Mahatma was living as a sadhu under a tree in the forest. He always used to keep with him three stones. While sleeping, he used to keep one of them under the head, another under the waist, and the third under the legs and cover himself with a sheet. When it rained, the body used to be on the stones and so the water would flow underneath and the water that fell on the sheet, too, would flow down, so there was no disturbance to his sleep. He used to sleep soundly. When sitting, he used to keep the three stones together like a hearth and sit upon them comfortably. Hence snakes and other reptiles did not trouble him, nor did he trouble them, for they used to crawl through the slits under the stones. Somebody used to bring him food, and he would eat it. And so, there was nothing for him to worry about. A king who came to the forest for hunting saw this sadhu and felt, what a pity, how much must he be suffering by having to adjust his body suitably to those stones and sleep thereon. I will take him home and keep him with me for at least one or two days and make him feel comfortable. So thinking, he went home 
and sent two of his soldiers with a palanquin and bears, with instructions to invite the sadhu respectfully and bring him to his palace. He also said that if they did not succeed in bringing the sadhu, they would be punished. They came and saw the sadhu and told him that the king had ordered them to bring him to the palace and that he should come. When he showed disinclination to go with them, they said that they would be punished if they returned without him. So they begged of him to come, if only to save them from trouble. As he did not want them to get into trouble on his account, he agreed to go with them. What was there for him to pack up? A calpinum, a sheet, and those three stones. He folded and kept the calpinum in that sheet, kept those three stones also in the sheet, and tied them together. What is this? This Swami is bringing with him some stones when he is going to the Raja's palace? Is he mad or what? thought those soldiers. Anyway, he got into the palanquin with his bundle and came to the king. The Raja saw the bundle and, thinking it contained some personal effects, took him into the palace with due respect and feasted him properly and arranged a tape cot with a mattress of silk cotton to sleep upon. The sadhu opened his bundle, took out the three stones, spread them on the bed, covered himself with the sheet, and slept as usual. The next morning the king came, bowed to him with respect, and asked, Swami, is it comfortable for you here? Yes. What is there wanting here? I am always happy. That is not it, Swami. You were experiencing hardships in the forest by having to sleep on those stones. Here, this bed in this house must be giving you happiness. That is why I am asking. The bed that was there is here also. The bed that is here is there also. So I have the same happiness everywhere. There is nothing wanting at any time, either in regard to my sleep or to my happiness. The king was puzzled and looked at the cot. He saw that the three stones were on it, whereupon the king immediately prostrated himself before the sadhu and said, O oh, great man, without knowing your greatness, I brought you here with the intention of making you happy. I did not know that you are always in a state of happiness, and so I behaved in this foolish manner. Please excuse me and bless me. After making up for his mistake in this way, he allowed the sadhu to go his way. This is the story of the sadhu. So in the eyes of Mahatmas, the free life is the real happy life? Asked the devotee. What else? Life in big buildings like this is like a prison. Only I may be a class prisoner. When I sit on mattresses like these, I feel that I am sitting on prickly pears. Where is peace and comfort? said Bhagavan. Next day that mattress was taken away and the usual mattress was spread on the couch. Even so, several people thought that it might be better to leave Bhagavan to a free life like that of the sadhu. But Bhagavan had to stay there alone, like a parrot in the cage of the devotees, because the devotees never leave him free. A devotee asked, can anyone get any benefit by repeating sacred syllables, mantras, picked up casually? Sri Bhagavan replied, No, he must be competent and initiated in such mantras. To illustrate this, he told the following story. A king visited his minister in his residence. There he was told that the minister was engaged in repetition of sacred syllables, japa. The king waited for him, and on meeting him, asked, what the japa was. The minister said that it was the holiest of all, Gayatri. The king desired to be initiated by the minister, but the minister confessed his inability to initiate him. Therefore the king learned it from someone else. And meeting the minister later, he repeated the Gayatri and wanted to know if it was right. The minister said that the mantra was correct, but it was not proper for him to say it. When pressed for an explanation, the minister called to a page close by and ordered him to take hold of the king. The order was not obeyed. The order was often repeated and still not obeyed. The king flew into a rage and ordered the same man to hold the minister, and it was immediately done. The minister laughed and said that the incident was the explanation required by the king. How? asked the king. The minister replied. 
The order was the same, and the executor also, but the authority was different. When I ordered, the effect was nil, whereas when you ordered, there was immediate effect. Similarly with mantras. Peace is the sole criterion. When asked about the characteristics of a jnani, Bhagavan said, They are described in books such as the Bhagavad Gita, but we must bear in mind that the jnani's state is one which transcends the mind, cannot be described by the mind. Only silence can correctly describe this state and its characteristics. Silence is more effective than speech. From silence came the ego. From the ego came thought, and from thought came speech. So if speech is effective, how much more effective must be its original source? Then, in this connection, Sri Bhagavan related the following story. Tatvaraya composed a barani, a kind of poetic composition in Tamil, in honor of his guru, Svarupanada, and convened an assembly of learned pandits to hear the work and assess its value. The pandits raised the objection that a barani was only composed in honor of great heroes, capable of killing a thousand elephants, and that it was not in order to compose such a work in honor of an ascetic. Thereupon the author said, Let us all go to my guru, and we shall have this matter settled there. They went to the guru, and after all had taken their seats, the author told his guru the purpose of their coming there. The guru sat silent and all the others also remained in Mauna. The whole day passed, night came, and some more days and nights, and yet all sat there silently. No thought at all occurring to any of them, and nobody asked why they had come there. After three or four days like this, the guru moved his mind a bit, and thereupon the assembly regained their thought activity. They then declared, Conquering a thousand elephants is nothing compared to the Guru's power to conquer the rutting elephants of all our egos put together. So certainly he deserves the Barani in his honor. The Garlic Plant While Bhagavan was perusing the monthly journal Griharakshmi, he began to laugh and handed the journal to Suri Nagama as she was leaving the hall, saying, the greatness of garlic is described in it. Please read it. The article contained recipes for making chutneys and pickles, and in conclusion, it stated that there is nothing equal to it in its greatness and its benefit to the body. When Suri Nagama returned to the hall in the afternoon, Sri Bhagavan inquired if she had read the article and said, People say it is very good for health. Really, is it so? It cures rheumatism and gives strength to the body. For children, it acts like amrit, nectar. Garlic is also known as amrit. A devotee asked how it got that name. Sri Bhagavan replied, There is a curious story about it, and began telling the following story. As is well known when gods, devas, and demons, rakashas, turned the ocean, amrit came out of it. When rakashas were running away with the vessel containing amrit, the devas appealed to Vishnu. Vishnu came on the scene in the shape of Mohini and Tantris and offered to resolve their quarrel by serving Amrit to them all. They agreed. While serving it to the gods first, it appeared that there might not be enough to go round for the demons. One of the latter got into the line of the gods, unobserved by Mohini, and was swallowing the Amrit when the sun and moon noticed it and gave her the hint. She threw the ladle with which the Amrit was being served at the demon in such a way as to cut off its head. The ladle became the chakra, an invincible lethal weapon of Vishnu, and cut off his head. But as the Amrit had already gone down his throat, the head became a graha, planet, and has since been taking vengeance on the sun and moon at the time of an eclipse. That is the story. Now when the head of the demon was severed, the trunk fell down, and in the process, a few drops of Amrit fell on the ground. It is said that those drops became the garlic plant. That is why it is said that garlic has some of the properties of Amrit. It is very good for the body, 
But since it also has the touch of the demon, it has damasic qualities too, which when eaten affect the mind. Hence it is forbidden for sadhikas. I and you. An earnest devotee asked Sri Bhagavan about the method to realize the self. As usual, Sri Bhagavan told him to find out who is the I in his question. After a few more questions in this strain, the devotee asked, Instead of inquiring, Who am I? Can I put the question to myself, Who are you? Since then my mind will be fixed on you, whom I consider to be God in the form of Guru. Sri Bhagavan replied, Whatever form your inquiry may take, you must finally come to the one eye, the self. All these distinctions made between I and you, master and disciple, are merely a sign of one's ignorance. That I supreme alone is. To think otherwise is to delude oneself. Thereupon, Sri Bhagavan told the following story. A Puranic story of sage Ribhu and his disciple Nidaga is particularly instructive. Although Ribhu taught his disciple the supreme truth of the one Brahman without a second, Nidaga, in spite of his erudition and understanding, did not get sufficient conviction to adopt and follow the path of Dhyana, but settled down in his native town to lead a life devoted to the observance of ceremonial religion. But the sage loved his disciple as deeply as the latter venerated his master. In spite of his age, Ribhu would himself go to his disciple in the town just to see how far the latter had outgrown his ritualism. At times the sage went in disguise so that he might observe how Nidaga would act when he did not know that he was being observed by his master. On one such occasion, Ribhu had put on the disguise of a rustic, found Nigada intently watching a royal procession. Unrecognized by the town dweller, Nigdaka, the village rustic inquired what the bustle was all about and was told that the king was going in procession. Oh, it is the king. He goes in procession. But where is he? asked the rustic. There on the elephant, said Nigdaka. You say the king is on the elephant? Yes, I see the two, said the rustic. But which is the king and which is the elephant? What? exclaimed Nigdaka. You see the two, but do not know that the man above is the king and the animal below is the elephant? What is the use of talking to a man like you? Pray, be not impatient with an ignorant man like me, begged the rustic. But you said above and below. What do they mean? Nidanga could stand it no more. You see the king and the elephant, the one above and the other below. Yet you want to know what is meant by above and below? Burst out Nigdaga, if things seen and words spoken can convey so little to you, action alone can teach you. Bend forward, and you will know it all too well. The rustic did as he was told. Nigdaga got on his shoulders and said, Know it now. I am above as the king. You are below as the elephant. Is that clear enough? No, not yet, was the rustic's quiet reply. You say you are above like the king and I am below like the elephant. The king, the elephant, above and below, so far it is clear. But pray tell me what you mean by I and you. When the Daga was thus confronted all of a sudden with the mighty problem of defining the you apart from the I, light dawned on his mind. At once he jumped down and fell at his master's feet, saying, who else but my venerable master Ribhu could have thus drawn my mind from the superficialities of physical existence to the true being of the self? O oh, benign master, I crave thy blessings. Earnestness or Faith Shraddha A devotee obtained a copy of Sri Bhagavan's work, Uladu Narpadu, 40 Verses on Reality, and began to write out the entire work for himself. Seeing him doing this writing with earnestness, though with a certain amount of difficulty and strain, since the devotee was not accustomed to squatting and doing continuous writing work, Bhagavan told the story of a sannyasi and his disciples to illustrate what is called Shraddha, 
earnestness of purpose. There was once a guru who had eight disciples. One day he instructed them all to make a copy of his teachings from a notebook he had kept. One of them, who had lived an easy-going life before renouncing the world, could not make a copy for himself. He therefore paid a couple of rupees to a fellow disciple and requested him to make a copy for him also. The guru examined the copy books one day and, noticing two books in the same handwriting, asked the disciples for an explanation. Both the writer and the one on whose behalf it was written told the truth about it. The master commented that though speaking the truth was an essential quality of a spiritual aspirant, it alone would not carry one to one's goal, but that shraddha, earnestness of purpose, was also necessary. Since this had not been exhibited by the disciple who had entrusted his own labor to another, he was disqualified from discipleship. Referring to his making payment for the work, the guru sarcastically remarked that salvation costs more than that, and he was at liberty to purchase it rather than undergo training under him. So saying, he dismissed that disciple. In the world, but not of the world. Kaduveli Siddhar was famed as a very austere hermit. He lived on the dry leaves fallen from trees. The king of the country heard of him and offered a reward to one who would prove this man's worth. A rich dasi agreed to do it. She began to live near the recluse and pretended to attend on him. She gently left pieces of pabadam along with the dry leaves picked by him. When he had eaten them, she began to leave other kinds of tasty food along with the dry leaves. Eventually, he took good tasty dishes supplied by her. They became intimate, and a child was born to them. She reported the matter to the king. The king wanted to know if she could prove their mutual relationship to the general public. She agreed and suggested a plan of action. Accordingly, the king announced a public dancing performance by the Dasi and invited the people to it. The crowd gathered, and she also appeared, but not before she had given a dose of physic to the child and left it in charge of the saint at home. As the dance was at its height, the child was crying at home for its mother. The father took the babe in his arms and went to the dancing performance. As she was dancing, hilariously, he could not approach her with the child. She noticed the man and the babe and contrived to kick her legs in the dance so as to unloose one of her anklets just as she approached the place where the saint was. She gently lifted her foot and tied the anklet. The public shouted and laughed, but he remained unaffected. Yet to prove his worth, he sang a Tamil song, meaning, For victory let go my anger, I release my mind when it rushes away. If it is true that I sleep day and night quite aware of myself, may this stone burst into twain and become the wide expanse. Immediately the stone idol burst with a loud noise. The people were astounded. Thus he proved himself an unswerving nyani. One should not be deceived by the external appearance of a nyani. Verse 181 of Vedanta Chudamani further explains this. Its meaning is as follows. Although a jivan mukta associated with the body may, owing to his parabda, appear to lapse into ignorance or wisdom, yet he is only pure like the ether, akasha, which is always itself clear, whether covered by dense clouds or without being covered by clouds. He always revels in the self alone, like a loving wife taking pleasure with her husband alone though she attends on him with things obtained from others, by way of fortune, as determined by her prarabdha. Though he remains silent like one devoid of learning, his supineness is due to the implicit duality of vekari, vak, spoken words, of the Vedas. His silence is the highest expression of the realized non-duality, which is after all the true content of the Vedas. Though he instructs his disciples, he does not pose as a teacher in the full conviction that the teacher and the disciple are mere conventions born of illusion, maya. And so he continues to utter words like akasbani. If, on the other hand, 
he mutters words incoherently like a lunatic, it is because his experience is inexpressible. If his words are many and fluent like those of an orator, they represent the recollection of his experience, since he is the unmoving, non-dual one without any desire awaiting fulfillment. Although he may appear grief-stricken like any other man in bereavement, yet he evinces just the right love of and pity for the senses which he earlier controlled before he realized that they were mere instruments and manifestations of the Supreme Being. When he seems keenly interested in the wonders of the world, he is only ridiculing the ignorance born of superimposition. If he appears wrathful, he means well to the offenders. All his actions should be taken to be only divine manifestations on the plane of humanity. There should not arise even the least doubt as to his being emancipated while yet alive. He lives only for the good of the world. Total Abidance A devotee asks, How does the repetition of the name of God help realization? Sri Bhagavan replied, The original name is always going on spontaneously without any effort on the part of the individual. That name is Aham, I. But when it becomes manifest, it manifests as Amkara, the ego. The oral repetition of the name leads one to mental repetition, which finally resolves itself into the eternal vibration. The mind or the mouth cannot act without the self. Thereupon, Sri Bhagavan told the following story. Tukaram, the great Maharashtra saint, used to remain in Samadhi in the day and sing and dance at night with large crowds of people. He always used to utter the name of Sri Rama. Once he was answering the call of nature and also saying Ram Ram, an orthodox priest was shocked at the uttering of the holy name by the saint when his body was not clean. Hence, he reprimanded him and ordered him to be silent. Tukaram said, All right, and remained mute. But at once there arose the name of Rama from every pore of Tukaram, and the priest was horrified by the din. He then prayed to Tukaram, Restrictions are only for the common people and not for saints like you. Quiet Piety There was a king with the devoted queen. She was a devotee of Sri Rama and yearned that her husband should similarly be a devotee. One night she found that the king mumbled something in his sleep. She kept her ears close to his lips and heard the word Rama repeated continually as in Japa. She was delighted and the next day ordered the minister to hold a feast. The king, having partaken of the feast, asked his wife for an explanation. She related the whole occurrence and said that the feast was in gratitude to God for the fulfillment of a long-cherished wish. The king was, however, annoyed that his devotion should have been found out. Some say that having thus betrayed God, he considered himself unworthy of God, and so committed suicide. It means that one should not openly display one's piety. We may take it that the king told the queen not to make a fuss over his piety, and they then lived happily together. Unknown Tenth Man Not having realized the truth that the self alone exists, should I adopt bhakti and yoga margas as being more suitable for purposes of sadhana than vichara marga? Is not the realization of one's absolute being, that is, brahmanyana, something quite unattainable to a layman like me? Brahmanyana is not a knowledge to be acquired, so that acquiring it one may obtain happiness. It is one's ignorant outlook that one should give up. The self you seek to know is barely a self. Your supposed ignorance causes you needless grief, like that of the ten foolish men who grieved the loss of the tenth man who was never lost. The ten foolish men in the parable forded a stream and on reaching the other shore wanted to make sure that all of them had, in fact, safely crossed the stream. One of the ten began to count, but while counting others, left himself out. I see only nine. Sure enough, we have lost one. Who can it be? He said. 
Did you count correctly? Asked another, and did the counting himself. But he too counted only nine. One after the other, each of the ten counted only nine, missing himself. We are only nine, they all agreed. But who is the missing one? They asked themselves. Every effort they made to discover the missing individual failed. Whoever he be that is drowned, said the sentimental of ten fools. We have lost him. So saying, he burst into tears, and the rest of the nine followed suit. Seeing them weeping on the river bank, a sympathetic wayfarer inquired for the cause. They related what had happened and said that even after counting themselves several times, they could find no more than nine. On hearing the story, but seeing all the ten before him, the wayfarer guessed what had happened. In order to make them know for themselves that they were really ten, and that all of them had come safe from the crossing, he told them, Let each of you count for himself, but one after the other, serially, one, two, three, and so on, while I shall give you each a blow, so that all of you may be sure of having been included in the count, and included only once. The tenth missing man will then be found. Hearing this, they rejoiced at the prospect of finding their lost comrade, and accepted the method suggested by the wayfarer. While the kind wayfarer gave a blow to each of the ten in turn, he that got the blow counted himself aloud. Ten, said the last man as he got the last blow in his turn. Bewildered, they looked at one another. We are ten, they said with one voice and thanked the wayfarer for having removed their grief. That is the parable. From where was the tenth man brought in? Was he ever lost? By knowing that he had been there all the while, did they learn anything new? The cause of their grief was not the real loss of any one of the ten. It was their own ignorance, rather than mere suspicion that one of them was lost. So they could not find who he was, because they counted only nine. God works for his devotee. On a particular day in the year, the god and the goddess are taken to an adjoining field, and the festival of the gods and goddesses is celebrated. This is in memory of the fact that one day Sundara Murti Swami entered the temple and found to his dismay that neither god nor goddess were there, and that on searching for them he found them in a field working at transplanting seedlings for a devotee, Harijan. Each reflects his own nature. Anayanar went to Kalahasti for the darshan of God. He saw all the people there as Shiva and Shakti because he himself was so. Again, Dharmaputra considered that the whole world was composed of people having some merit or other and that each of them was even better than he himself for some reason or other whereas Duryodhana could not find even a single good person in the world. Each reflects his own nature. The Master's Payment A disciple served his master for a long time and realized the self. He was in bliss and wanted to express his gratitude to the master. He was in tears of joy and his voice choked when he spoke. He said, what a wonder that I did not know my very self all these years. I suffered long, and you so graciously helped me to realize the self. How shall I repay your grace? Is it not in your power to do it? The master replied, Well, well, your repayment consists in not lapsing into ignorance again, but in continuing in the state of your real self. The fault lies in exposure. Ezutachan, a great saint and author, had a few fish concealed on him when he entered the temple. The saint was searched and taken to the king. The king asked him, Why did you take the fish into the temple? He replied, It is not my fault. I had it concealed in my clothes. The others exposed the fish in the temple. The fault lies in exposure. Excreta within the body are not considered filth, but when excreted, they are considered filthy, so also with this. Brahmachari's Touch Sri Bhagavan warned the hearers against the mistake of disparaging a jnani 
for his apparent conduct and again cited the story of Parichi. He was a stillborn child. The ladies cried and appealed to Sri Krishna to save the child. The sages roundabout wondered how Krishna was going to save the child from the effects of the arrows of Asvatthama. Krishna said, If the child be touched by one eternally celibate, the child would be brought to life. Then Shuka dared not touch the child. Finding no among the reputed saints bold enough to touch the child, Krishna went and touched it, saying, If I am eternally celibate, may the child be brought to life. The child began to breathe and later grew up to become Parikshit. Just consider how Krishna, surrounded by 16,000 gopis, is a brahmachari. Such is the mystery of Jivanmukti. A Jivanmukta is one who does not see anything separate from the self. The King and His Ministers What is the difference between a man who makes no attempt and remains an ajani and another who gains a glimpse and returns to ajnana? In the latter case, a stimulus is always present to goad him on to further efforts until the realization is perfect. The Shrutis say this knowledge of Brahman shines forth once and forever. They refer to the permanent realization and not to the glimpse. How is it possible that a man forgets his own experience and falls back into ignorance? Sri Bhagavan related this with the following story. There was a king who treated his subjects well. One of his ministers gained his confidence and misused the influence. All the other ministers and officers were adversely affected and they hit upon a plan to get rid of him. They instructed the guards not to let the man enter the palace. The king noted his absence and inquired after him. He was informed that the man was taken ill and could not therefore come to the palace. The king deputed his physician to attend on the minister. False reports were conveyed to the king that the minister was sometimes improving and at other times collapsing. The king desired to see the patient but the pandit said that such an action was against the dharma. Later the minister was reported to have died. The king was very sorry when he heard the news. The arrogant minister was kept in form of all the happenings by spies of his own. He tried to foil the other ministers. He waited for the king to come out of the palace so that he might report himself to the king. On one occasion he climbed up a tree hid himself among the branches and awaited the king. The king came out that night in the palanquin and the man in hiding jumped down in front of the palanquin and shouted his identity. The companion of the king was equally resourceful. He at once took out a handful of sacred ashes, vibhuti, from his pocket and scattered it in the air so that the king was obliged to close his eyes. The companion also shouted, Victory, Jai, to the king and ordered the band to play so that the other man's shout was drowned in the noise. He also ordered the palanquin bearers to move fast, and he himself sang incantations to keep off evil spirits. The king was thus left under the impression that the dead man's ghost was playing pranks with him. The disappointed man became desperate and retired into the forest for tapasya, austerities. After a long time, the king happened to go hunting. He came across the former minister seated in deep contemplation, but he hastened away from the spot lest the ghost should molest him. The Greatness of Japa A devotee asked, Swami, what is the easiest way to attain moksha? Bhagavan said with a smile, As and when the mind goes astray, it should be turned inward and made to steady itself and the thought of self. That is the only way. Another devotee said, To do so, the repeating of the name of Rama is good, is it not? Certainly it is good, said Bhagavan. What could be better? The greatness of the japa of the name of Rama is extraordinary. In the story of Namadeva, he is reported to have told one devotee, if you want to know the greatness of the name of Rama, you must first know what your own name is, what your real nature, Swarupa, is, 
who you are, and how you were born. Unless you know your own origin, you will not know your name. This idea is found in the Abhangas of Namadeva, written in the Marathi language, and in the Malaya Yam Aritma Ramayana. Thereupon Bhagavan related a story from the latter. It is stated in that book that when Anjaneya went in search of Sita, he seated himself opposite to Ravana in the Darbarho on the high pedestal and fearlessly spoke to him thus, O oh, Ravana, I give you a teaching, Upadesa, for attaining liberation, Moksha. Please listen to me carefully. It is certain that the self, Atma, gets purified by intense devotion to Hari, and who is in the lotus of the heart at all times. The ego gets destroyed and then the sin gets destroyed. Afterwards, in its place, the knowledge of the transcendent self emerges. With a pure mind and with the bliss Ananda generated by a firm knowledge of the self, the two letters, Ra, Ma, which are like mantras, will repeat themselves within you automatically. What more is required for a person who has this knowledge, however little it might be? Hence, worship the lotus feet of Vishnu, which will remove all worldly fears, which are dear to all devotees and which shine as brightly as the light of the core of suns. Give up the ignorance of your mind. This has been mentioned in two or three slokas in the Sanskrit Adhyatma Ramayanam, but not as elaborately as in the Mayalalam text. Is the greatness of the name of Rama ordinary? Silent Eloquence Lakshman Brahmachari from Sri Ramakrishna Mission asked, Inquiry of who am I or of the I thought, being itself a thought, how can it be destroyed in the process? Sri Bhagavan replied with the story. When Sita was asked who was her husband among the Rishis, Rama himself being present there as a Rishi, in the forest by the wives of the Rishis, she denied each one as he was pointed out to her, but simply hung down her head when Rama was pointed out. Her silence was eloquent. Similarly, the Vedas also are eloquent in their neti neti, not this, not this, and then remain silent. Their silence is the real state. This is the meaning of exposition by silence. When the source of the I thought is reached, it vanishes, and what remains is the self. Headship of a Moot A devotee told Bhagavan about his ill health treatment by doctors and services rendered to him by his servants. Bhagavan did not immediately reply to him, but in the evening when the devotees all gathered, he began massaging his own legs with oil. Looking at the questioner with a smile, he said, We are our own doctors and our own servants. The questioner then said, What are we to do if we do not have strength like Bhagavan to attend to our own work? Bhagavan's reply was, if we have strength to eat, why should we not have strength to do this? The questioner could not say anything and so kept silent with his head bent. Just then the post arrived. After looking through the letters, Bhagavan narrated the following story. Once a certain sannyasi was anxious to be the head of a moot. He had to have disciples, you see, and he tried his level best to secure some. Anyone who came soon found out the limited knowledge of the person and so went away. No one stayed on. What could he do? One day he had to go to a city. There he had to keep up his position, but he had no disciple. No one must know this. His bundle of clothes, etc. was on his head. So he thought he would place the bundle in some household unobserved and then pretend to go there afterwards. He wandered throughout the place. Whenever he tried to step into a house, he found a number of people in front of it. Poor chap. What could he do? It was almost evening. He was tired. At last he found a house with no one in front. The door was open. Greatly relieved, he placed the bundle in one corner of the house and then sat in the veranda. 
After a while, the lady of the house came out and inquired who he was. Me, I am the head of a moat in such and such a place. I came to this city on some work. I heard that you were good householders. I therefore sent my belongings to my disciple to put them in your house, thinking that we could put up with you for a night and go away next morning. Has he done so? No one has come, sir, she said. No, please, no, please, I ask him to put the bundle here, go to the bazaar and get some things. Kindly see if he has put it in any corner, he said. When the lady searched this side and that, she saw the bundle in one corner. Thereupon she and her husband welcomed him and gave him food, etc. Rather late in the night, they asked, How is it, sir, your disciple has not come yet? He said, Perhaps that useless fellow has eaten something in the bazaar and is wandering about. You please go to bed. If he comes, I will open the door for him. That couple had by then understood the sannyasi's true position. They thought they would see further fun and so went into the house to lie down. Then the person started his acting. He opened the door and closed it, making a loud noise so as to be heard by the members of the household. He then said loudly, why, what have you been doing so long? Take care if you do it again. I shall beat you black and blue. Be careful, henceforth. Changing his tone thereafter, he said in a plaintive voice, Swami, Swami, please excuse me. I shall not do it again. Assuming the original tone, he said, All right, come here. Massage my legs here. No, there. No, please, hit lightly with your fist. Yes, a little more. So saying, he massaged his own legs and then said, Enough, it is rather late, go to bed. So saying, he went to sleep. There was a hole in the wall of the room where the couple were staying and through it they saw the whole farce. In the early morning, the sannyasi again began repeating the evening's performance, saying, You lazy fellow, the cocks have begun to crow. Go to so and so's house and come back after doing such and such work. So saying, he opened the door, pretended to send him away, and went back to bed. The couple saw this also. In the morning he bundled up his belongings, put the bundle in a corner, and went to a tank nearby for bathing, etc. The couple took the bundle and hid it somewhere. The sannyasi returned and searched the whole room, but the bundle was not found anywhere. So he asked the lady of the house, Where's my bundle? The couple then replied, Sir, your disciple came here and took away the bundle, saying you wanted him to bring it to you. It is the same person who massaged your legs last night. He must be round the corner. Please see, Swami. What could he do then? He kept his mouth shut and started going home. This is what happens if a disciple serves you, just like me. We are our own servants. So saying, Bhagavan pretended to massage his legs with his hands and his fists. Bhakta Ekanath A discussion in the hall centered on the story of Kula Sekhara Alwar, which had appeared in the Vision magazine. During Aharikata, Kula Sekhara, identifying himself so completely with the situation of the story, felt it his duty as a worshipper of Rama to at once hasten to Lanka and release Sita. He ran to the sea and entered it to cross over to Lanka. When Rama appeared with Sita and Laxmana and showered his grace on him, this led others in the hall to remark. Some Maharatta saint also did a similar thing. He leaped up to the roof, I think. Thereupon, Sri Bhagavan related the story. Ekanat was writing the Ramayana and when he came to the portion in which he was graphically describing that Hanuman jumped across the ocean to Lanka, he so identified himself with his hero, Hanuman, that unconsciously he leaped into the air and landed on the roof of his neighbor's house. This neighbor had always had a poor opinion of Ekanak, taking him for a humbug and religious hypocrite. He heard a thud on his roof and coming out to see what it was, discovered Ekanak lying down on the roof with a cadjan leaf in one hand and his iron style in the other. The cadjan leaf had verses describing how Hanuman leaped across the sea. 
This incident proved to the neighbor what a genuine Bhakta Ekanak was, and he became his disciple. After a pause, Bhagavan also related, God appeared in a dream to Ekanak and asked him to go and repair the tomb of Yaneswar. When Ekanak went there, accordingly, he found a contractor ready to do all the work and take payment at the end. The contractor opened a big account in which all the expenses were entered, with the names of all the workmen and wages paid. Everything went on systematically. When the work of repairs was completed, the accounts were looked into and the contractor paid his dues. Then the contractor and his big account book totally disappeared. Then alone, Ekanak came to know that God was his contractor and did the work. Such things have happened.